Welcome to the 2020 Citizens Climate Lobby Conference. My name is Mark Reynolds. I'm a member of the CCL staff and I'm honored to be hosting this conference. Our country, and for that matter, the world, are, are dealing with three huge crises, a financial crisis, a pandemic, and racism. In the meantime, global climate change is not going away, but neither are we. This week, we will see almost the entire House and Senate. I wanna thank all the CCL volunteers and staff who've worked very hard to make sure that our crucial work is continuing in the face of a very, very difficult world. In a minute, I'm gonna tell you what's gonna be happening over the, next, over the course of today, and hopefully a lot of you will be able to join us for tomorrow also. But before that, we'd like to get a sense of where people are joining us from around the world. So there's a map where you can place a pin by going to poll com slash ccl123 and you could have put a pin in to show where you're joining a lot of people have obviously done that already you can see a ton of people uh, in the u.s you see people in canada you see a lot in mexico you can see people throughout africa europe and asia i can see people in china um, there are this is really uh people from all over the world joining us it is so great to have so many of you unfortunately our program only allows the first 700 people to join us, but it's nice to see that we've got people calling in and joining us from just about every continent in the world. In fact, it looks like other than Antarctica, it looks like we've got most of the world covered. Thank you all so much. It is great to have you from so many places around the world. So doing the conference virtually allows us to do some things that we wouldn't ordinarily be able to do. If we were doing this conference live, we would have time to hear from one person. But what we were able to do is to get pre-recorded messages from both of the founders of the Senate Climate Solutions Caucus, Senator Coons and Senator Braun. Uh, Senator Braun will talk about a bill that he just introduced that Senator Sheldon Whitehouse calls a no kidding breakthrough. We'll also hear from former Representative Carlos Corbello, who was one of the co-founders of the original House Climate Solutions Caucus, and maybe most importantly, Rachel Kite. We have a worldwide program, and Rachel Kite has been one of the people who's been instrumental in worldwide negotiations, including Paris. So we're very honored that she could also um, give us a message for our opening session. After the opening sessions, at 2 o'clock East Coast time, we'll start breakouts. And what's going to happen is first, we're going to have a 20-minute breakout session. Then we're going to have another 20-minute breakout session. We're also very excited about the people that we have for those sessions. So we have people like Lisa Friedman from the New York Times, Alex Flint from Alliance for Market Solutions, Susan Henderchild from Interfaith Power and Light, and John Woods Jr. from Braver Angels. So our first set of breakouts will go uh, from two o'clock East Coast time, 20 minutes each, then we'll have a break. And then we start a second set of breakouts at three o'clock, and those will be two half hour sessions. The final plenary will start at 4.20 today, and that will in, uh, include two people. One, Adrian Rafizadeh, who I think you're gonna love to hear the story of how a high school Republican found his way to climate change and then to Citizens Climate Lobby. And then you'll be hearing in concluding remarks, our Vice President of Government Affairs, Dr. Danny Richter. I'm hoping that many of you can join us tomorrow also. All of those sessions are four standalone sessions and they, they're longer, they, they require more time because of the issues that they're working on. So that includes beyond diversity, uh, challenging questions for the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act, uh, International Climate Workshop and depolarizing from within. So those are all longer sessions. I hope that many of you can join us for those tomorrow. I know that for a lot of you who are joining us virtually today, you've probably had a chance to come to Washington DC with us and be there for the live conference. And I imagine that a lot of you are like me, that one of the things that you loved was uh, hearing from our founder every year. And I know that um, many of you know that Marshall passed away in December, but I thought it would be nice if we could hear from him one more time. We are building an army, a peaceful army. And our weapons are truth and nonviolence, and as we keep saying over again, respect and admiration for those who would oppose us. 
You and I are engaged in a battle for all of life. All of life. Not just humankind, but for all of life. I don't see anybody else coming. <laughs> you know, when you get in a dire situation, the cavalry shows up, right? Well, I think I'm sure of it. You are the cavalry. We are the cavalry. <laughs> Two years ago and then last year at the conferences, I came back saying Congress in the, is in the grip of fear. And the only way people can break through their fear is with love, appreciation, respect, and admiration, all those things that uh, we really uh, know how to do. And it is the fastest way there is. And force is the slowest way. And so it's love and appreciation and admiration that we will use as our, as our weapons tomorrow and when we go back to our uh, communities. In 2007, Marshall Saunders started the first Citizens Climate Lobby chapter with 29 people. 25 people came to our first conference in 2010. And that same year, volunteers in Canada began to organize. My name is Joe Robertson. I'm the Global Strategy Director for Citizens Climate. In 2014, we had volunteers in the US, Canada, Bangladesh, and Sweden. Germany and Australia soon followed. By 2017, we had volunteers working in 34 countries. A year ago, we had volunteers in 50 countries. We now have nearly 200,000 members in 60 countries. The destabilization of the climate system is a global crisis. We need all nations to establish ambitious visions for a climate smart, low emissions economy. Then to legislate, invest, and act on that vision. Ahead of the next round of UN climate negotiations, all nations are required to upgrade their national climate plans in support of the Paris Agreement, the explicit aim of which is to free all peoples and nations from the threat of worsening climate disruption. We need all nations to work together. The UN climate change negotiations are set up to achieve this. The Climate Convention is actually constitutional law in the US. A ratified treaty is the supreme law of the land. In the UN process, our international team works on participation to bring citizens and stakeholders' voices into the process. We formed an international climate dividend alliance to foster awareness and build technical capacity for enacting fee and dividend policies. We started Resilience Intel, a collaborative effort to network science insights to finance. We have spread awareness of the climate smart investable opportunities to protect the cryosphere, watersheds, and landscapes in the ocean by tracing their interconnections. And we've begun supporting food system transformation, connecting those complexities and landscapes to personal experience, all to build the political will for a resilient future, focused on household security and better conditions for people and for the planet. Rachel Kite is a great friend of CCL and a global leader of historic consequence. She's a former vice president of the World Bank Group, where she served as special envoy for climate and led the creation of the Carbon Pricing Leadership Coalition. She was named Special Representative of the UN Secretary General and CEO of Sustainable Energy for All. And she now serves as Dean of the Fletcher School for Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University and has recently become a member of the Food System Economics Commission. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to introduce to you our good friend, Rachel Kite. Hello, my name is Rachel Kite and I'm Dean of the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. It's my honor and privilege to be able to speak with you today and thank you for the invitation. I also, first of all, want to thank you. Thank you for being here. We live in troubled times, in turbulent times. We're dealing with short-term immediate crises and we mustn't at the same time then lose sight of the crises that are coming over the horizon towards us. Your ability to focus on both is a real sign of leadership. Thank you. 
the pandemic that we have been living with for the last few months, which has rent asunder global economic prospects, has shined a light on crises that we were living with and not responding to, a crisis of inequality and also the crises of climate change and their immediate and long-term impacts. It is important, therefore, that at this moment, when we think about building back better, we build back to build a more equal world, a more inclusive economy, and an economy that works for the planet. As I have said, we have been living with these crises in plain sight. We were warned about pandemics, and we are being warned about climate change. We have been warned about the drag on everybody of the inequality within our economies. But we have done little to respond with urgency to those warnings up to now. At the same time, we haven't seized upon the opportunities that are right there as well. There are known policy solutions for a world that needs to deeply decarbonize over the next few decades. There are known policy solutions for an economy that has to lift everybody up and leave no one behind. For many years, I worked to build political momentum for carbon pricing in the work of the Carbon Pricing Leadership Coalition, building on and standing on the shoulders of the technical work that had been done in many economies around the world. It seems self-evident that we should put a price on that which we do not want in our economy. And now, as we have to deeply decarbonize in rapid pace over the next decade or so, the known policy solutions need to be a place where we coalesce from the left and from the right, from the local, the national and the international. We have no time and we have no room for plausible deniability of we don't know what to do. We do. So you are the front line of the battle for uh, climate justice. You are the battle for an economy that works for all. You are the battle for the jobs that we need in the immediate recovery to this crisis, the jobs that can be found in renewable energy and energy efficiency and deep refurbishment of buildings in better soils and better land management, all of which are spurred to greater pace by the necessary, if insufficient, policy tool of pricing carbon effectively. We cannot suppose that we know what will happen in the voting ballots in this country and others around the world in the coming years. But whether you are running for Minutemen or for Councilmen, whether you are running for Mayor or for Governor, or whether you're running for the highest office in the land, the fact that we need to be resilient for other crises which are sitting in plain sight and that we have to be ready to work together for the solutions which are already in plain sight is self-evident. Your leadership coalition, you on this webinar today, this is where it starts. Thank you for all that you've done to get us to this point of understanding already. And thank you for everything that you will do in the months and years to come. Thank you. Hi, my name is Topher Anderson. I have the privilege of not only serving as the donor relations officer for Citizens Climate, but also as the liaison to Senator Mike Braun. Showing my youth a bit here, I graduated from undergraduate in 2017 as a younger Catholic Christian, moderate, right of center citizen who is deeply concerned about climate change. And when I found CCL, I finally felt like I had found a home. It was invigorating to know I could be authentic to what I believed while still using my voice to make progress on both sides of the aisle to address the urgent problem of climate change. I share this because I have felt a deep kinship with my Senator Mike Braun since his election in November 2018. When we met for the first time in a coffee shop just a month after his election, he showed that he was a hardworking business leader, a forester, a fellow Catholic Christian, and a Republican. Over the course of our two-year relationship, I have seen him lead and live out his identity with deep integrity, even in the face of political or media headwinds. And when he boldly launched the Bipartisan Senate Climate Solutions Caucus on October 19th of 2019, he made a home for Republicans, conservatives, and independents in Indiana and across the country who are aching for the government to take action on climate change. He has grown the Climate Solutions Caucus to an impressive team of seven Republicans, six Democrats, and one independent senator all of whom are ready to work across the aisle 
to craft durable solutions to climate change. His recent introduction of a bipartisan bill, the Growing Climate Solutions Act, helps farmers and foresters sequester carbon and more, it provides a model for conservatives to reclaim our heritage of conserving. We can do so by building consensus across the aisle, supporting American workers, and protecting our environment. So without further ado, it is my great pleasure to introduce Senator Mike Braun. This is Senator Mike Braun from Indiana. As a lifelong conservationist, I was proud to co-found the Senate Climate Solutions Caucus with Senator Chris Coons. For too long, Washington has been paralyzed by partisan gamesmanship, unable to have productive conversations about our changing climate. Through this caucus, we can have real conversations about protecting our environment, securing Americans' energy future, and protecting American manufacturing jobs. This month, I joined Senator Debbie Stabenow, Senator Lindsey Graham, and Senator Sheldon Whitehouse to introduce the Growing Climate Solutions Act, which will break down barriers for farmers and forest owners interested in participating in carbon markets so they can be rewarded for climate smart practices. This bill has the support of the American Farm Bureau Federation, National Corn Growers Association, the Environmental Defense Fund, McDonald's, Microsoft, and over 40 farm groups, environmental organizations, and Fortune 500 companies. As a Main Street entrepreneur and conservationist, I know firsthand that if we want to address our changing climate, we need to facilitate real solutions that our farmers, environmentalists, and industry can all support, which this bill accomplishes. I want to thank the Citizens Climate Lobby for their hard work. So grateful and inspired to be here with a community stronger than COVID, not divided by ideologies, but united by our values, which includes relationships, optimism, integrity, focus, diversity, and being bipartisan. My name is Solemi Hernandez, and I have the honor to be CCL Southeast Regional Coordinator. Our region includes Alabama, Georgia, Florida, North Carolina, and South Carolina. I have been a community grassroots activist for around seven years. I am a part-time political science student at Florida Gulf Coast University, and I am the mother of two wonderful young boys. That's them in the picture in the middle. Alexander, 10 years old, saying hi, and Patrick, who was seven years old at the time. My family and I experienced the world of a changing climate when Irma hit our community in 2017. We had to go to a shelter for three days, and we were, out with, we were without electricity for three weeks. We found solace in helping the most vulnerable communities, including the farm workers. In Florida, we have 9,301 supporters with 23 chapters. Six co-sponsors to HR 763, including Federica Wilson, that just co-sponsored the legislation on February 21st this year. 11 resolutions in support of carbon fee and dividend and similar policies, including Broward, who just endorsed HR 763 on May 19. Six Florida representatives in the Climate Solution Caucus in the House and Marco Rubio in the Senate. Over 150 business organizations and community leaders have provided us with endorsements. Here is Florida in action. And for this reason, it's an honor for me to present one of our own Florida climate heroes and community champion, Carlos Curbelo, founder of First Part Partisan Climate Solution Caucus in Congress. Hello, CCL. It's so good to be with you. I'm sorry that we cannot gather in person this year, but nevertheless, I'm very grateful that you would invite me to be a part of this special conference. Uh, I have great respect for your organization. We worked together. Uh, while I was in Congress for four years, and uh, we've continued working together since I left Congress at the beginning of last year. Thank you for everything you do to inform our elected leaders, uh, to rally Americans uh, from all across the country, from all across the political spectrum to the cause of mitigating carbon pollution, of acting on climate change in a responsible, constructive way that actually solves the problem and will allow us to deliver a healthy 
and secure planet to future generations of Americans. Uh, I know you all uh, work very hard to uh, promote the idea of carbon pricing, and uh, I certainly appreciate that having filed a carbon pricing bill in 2018. It was the first time in about a decade that a Republican in the U.S. House of Representatives filed a carbon pricing bill. The last one to do that, of course, was um, Congressman Inglis before me, uh, who was a great leader and pioneer. And since then, others like uh, Congressman Rooney and Congressman Fitzpatrick uh, have introduced their own bills. Uh, that would not have been possible without the activism, without the leadership of CCL, so thank you. And thank you uh, in particular for educating uh, the American people, for educating our elected leaders, members of Congress on carbon pricing and on why it is such a smart solution for uh, the big challenge that is uh, reducing carbon pollution in the world. Carbon pricing is actually a conservative idea. Uh, and that's because it is economically sound. Carbon pricing acknowledges, recognizes that pollution has a cost. Now, that cost isn't transparent. Uh, no one knows exactly what it is. No one knows if and when they're paying it. Uh, but it's there. It's in our economy. It's in the form of regulations. It's in the form of the investments that many cities throughout the country are having to make today to account for rising sea levels, for example, ocean acidification, dying coral reefs. Uh, a lot of farmers throughout our country are struggling with uh, different weather patterns that are a direct result of a changing climate. Of course, we know that hurricanes and other storms have grown more powerful as um, carbon pollution uh, has been pumped into our atmosphere. So we're paying uh, a cost for carbon pollution today, our economy just doesn't recognize it. And that's not a conservative concept. Hiding externalities, hiding costs inside an economy so that consumers cannot identify them is not a conservative way of thinking. However, acknowledging that there are costs, labeling them, and uh, having a transparent process where these costs are uh, uh, taken into account is a conservative idea and most importantly pricing carbon trusts the American people to make all the decisions and to do all the work uh, that is required for us to get on a path uh, of sustainability for us to actually get this uh, crisis under control reduce carbon pollution and build a clean energy future for our children and our grandchildren. Uh, when you price carbon, uh, you don't add regulations. On the contrary, you can actually reduce government regulation. When you price carbon and you adjust at the border, you don't need to trust other countries uh, to keep their commitments to uh, reducing carbon pollution what you're actually doing is uh, telling other countries that if they want to do business with the United States, they're going to have to account for carbon pollution one way or the other. Uh, so this is just a very uh, powerful policy instrument uh, that could do a number of important things. Number one is obviously to reduce uh, carbon pollution. Number two is to help our country uh, uh, get back on track in terms of its economy at a time when uh, we're all struggling uh, due to the uh, COVID-19 crisis and to the way it has hurt so many Americans, not just those who have suffered uh, in terms of their health and those who have obviously passed away, but every American has been affected by this crisis. Every American is looking for new opportunities uh, to get past this crisis here in the coming months and certainly next year. And um, a carbon pricing bill could really infuse our economy with new energy, with innovation, with new ideas uh, that will produce jobs that we can't even imagine today. Good, high quality paying jobs for American workers. Uh, carbon pricing 
embraces capitalism. It embraces free markets. It actually trusts markets, which means people, to make the best choices for them and for their futures. So uh, I'm grateful to you uh, that um, years after we first met, you're still fighting the good fight. You're still spreading uh, the word on this important policy solution. And most importantly, you are uh, doing what's right for young Americans, for our children, for our grandchildren, for those who stand to lose the most if we don't take this um, issue seriously and if we don't solve for climate change. I uh, oftentimes would tell my Republican colleagues on the floor of the U.S. House of Representatives that leaving an unsustainable environmental debt for future generations is as reckless and as selfish as leaving an unsustainable fiscal debt to future generations. Uh, we can do right uh, by all of us who are here on this beautiful earth today and by those who will follow us if we embrace smart solutions uh, to, uh, to climate change like carbon pricing. Solutions that conservatives can certainly celebrate because they trust the American people, they trust free markets, and they embrace capitalism. Thank you again, CCL, for allowing me to spend a few minutes with you virtually. Uh, I hope I will get to see many of you soon. Uh, and thank you in person for everything you did to help me during my time in Congress and for everything that you're doing for our great country to help us uh, solve for climate change, the great challenge of uh, this century. Thank you all very much. I wish you a wonderful rest of the conference. Me amo Sabrina Supin Fu. I'm the coordinator for the Mid-Atlantic region, which consists of New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland, and DC. While connecting remotely today, we must remember our human connections as we do this important work. So here's a photo of our region's most recent regional conference taken less than five months ago to help us remember our connections. The Mid-Atlantic region is by far the smallest landmass of CCL's 11 regions, but we are large in many ways. And this slide gives us a taste of this. You can see that we have two major bays supplying drinking water and economic activities for many beyond our region. In addition, we are rich in history. Here are a few of the Native American tribes in our region. This is where the work of Harriet Tubman took place, leading hundreds of slaves from Maryland through Delaware and to freedom in Philadelphia. We are home to the great orator, author, statesman, and abolitionist, Frederick Douglass. Thomas Edison invented the light bulb here in Menlo Park, New Jersey. And we are home to the exceptional statesman, Senator Chris Coons, here with his constituents, on our last lobby day. Senator Coons is a co-founder of the Senate Bipartisan Climate Solution Caucus, and I hope all of you have or will listen to Senator Coons' touching story now he became friends with Republican Senator Mike Braun in his keynote speech to our January Regional Conference. Senator Chris Coons' story clarifies for me what we need to do to change the direction of our country to one of bipartisan solutions by reaching out across the aisle and bringing the best out in each of us. So please welcome the most bipartisan member of Congress and one of my climate heroes, Senator Chris Coons. Hi, I'm U.S. Senator Chris Coons from Delaware. This is a difficult time for our nation. We're facing several crises that demand our attention. But as we respond to the pandemic, to the recession, and to demands for justice, we must also remain focused on addressing the climate crisis, which poses an urgent, even existential threat to our families, our communities, and our world. Thank you to the Citizens Climate Lobby for providing me the opportunity to address you virtually today and for the important work you do to push your elected leaders to take serious actions to address climate change. To the Delaware CCL members present, thank you for your enthusiastic and productive engagement at the state and national levels. I'd also like to thank Senator Braun of Indiana and former Representative Curbelo of Florida for their commitment to push forward meaningful climate solutions. Every part of the world is experiencing the impacts of climate change, from severe droughts and floods to devastating wildfires and hurricanes. As a senator representing the lowest lying state in the nation with an economy heavily dependent on tourism and agriculture, Delaware, my home state, is certainly on the front lines of this crisis. 
Delaware's farmers, business leaders, and families are coping with unpredictable and severe weather that's eroding coastlines and skyrocketing flood insurance prices. We need to come together to take immediate action. I've been working to advance carbon pricing legislation, which according to leading economists is one of the most effective ways to drive down carbon pollution and encourage market-driven innovation in clean energy technologies. Last year, I introduced the Climate Action Rebate Act, which would place a rapidly escalating price on carbon pollution to reduce U.S. carbon emissions by 55% over just the first 10 years. A majority of those revenues collected, 70%, would be returned directly to the American people in the form of a monthly dividend. And the remainder of the revenue raised would support climate resilient infrastructure, energy innovation, and assistance for vulnerable workers and communities. In 2018, I also introduced the Energy Innovation Carbon Dividend Act with former Republican Senator Jeff Flake, which was the first ever bipartisan carbon pricing bill introduced in the Senate. I believe enacting a federal price on carbon emissions is one of the most effective ways to meaningfully reduce emissions, and I'll continue engaging my colleagues on both sides of the aisle. But it's not the only thing we can do. That's why I've launched the first bipartisan Senate Climate Solutions Caucus with Senator Mike Braun of Indiana. We have 14 members, seven from each party, each side of the aisle, who agree that we must find common ground on this issue. We've been meeting with and listening to policy experts, business leaders, academics, and stakeholders to identify policies that would meaningfully address climate change. We're also having candid conversations about which ideas we could all support so we can work together to advance climate legislation. In May, the caucus convened a discussion with environmental groups and business leaders on natural climate solutions like forestry and sustainable agricultural production. Later this month, we'll hear from military and defense experts to discuss the impacts of climate change on our own national security. Caucus members have also heard firsthand from economists, environmental experts, and some of the largest companies in the world that they support placing a price on carbon emissions. Through these and other discussions, we're learning about the significant and worldwide impacts of climate change, leading policy ideas to address it, and finding ways to collaborate on each other's priorities. These discussions are leading to members of the caucus working on many policy ideas that would address climate change, from energy efficiency and innovation to carbon capture technology, reforestation, and agriculture. Congress has made steps in the right direction, but there is so much more we need to do, and we need your help to move forward. Strong and sustained engagement by groups like yours will play a critical role in bringing some of my more reluctant colleagues to the table so we can make progress together. Thank you. Thank you again for your work to make meaningful climate action a reality. Please stay safe, and I look forward to continue working with all of you. I'd like to thank uh, Senators Coons and Braun again for recording messages for us, for Representative Curbelo, and obviously Rachel Kite, thank you so much for that. And I also want to thank our um, CCL staff who I thought so beautifully introduced them, Joseph Robertson, Topher Anderson, Salemi Hernandez, and Sabrina Fu, thank you so much for doing that. So what's gonna happen over the next couple of days? We'll be taking a break in a few minutes at two o'clock Eastern time this afternoon. We'll be doing um, uh, two 20 minute breakout sessions, then there'll be a break again. And then at three o'clock East Coast time, we'll do a set of 30 minute breakouts and then we'll be coming back to this line. So for the other sessions that you'll be doing over the next couple of hours, those will be on other lines and you can get them in the program. Uh, we'll be coming back to this line at 420 Eastern time to hear the closing remarks. Um, and then what's gonna happen is uh, many of your chapters have actually set up appointments We'll be doing virtual meetings with, with most of the House and Senate over the course of this week. So thank you all for, for joining those meetings. We're looking forward to hearing how those are going. And as you saw in the program, maybe ahead of time, Thursday night, we're gonna have a celebration of what just happened over the course of this last week. So I hope that many of you can join you for that also. So again, we'll be going to a short break in just a moment, and then we'll see you back here on different lines for the different breakout sessions at two o'clock. Thank you so much. For anybody from the over 29 countries that joined around the world, there's 2,827 people who have already signed in. Thank you so much. We'll look forward to seeing you a little bit. Thank you for listening to this episode of Citizens Climate Lobby's training program. 
You can tune into more episodes anywhere podcasts are available. Inspired by what you heard today? Join Citizens Climate Lobby to advocate for bipartisan climate solutions. Go to community.citizensclimate.org to find more trainings, resources, your local chapter, national action teams, discussion forums, and more. Be sure to like our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Citizens Climate. We also invite all of our listeners to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more inspiration. And together, we are creating the political will for a livable world.